guys so much. Hey, good morning, family of God. How are we doing? All right, blessed and highly favored. It's not 80 degrees, but it's close, right? So uh, I'm loving the spring weather. Spring and fall in St. George, Utah, nothing like it, right? Right? Amen. I'm going to talk over here. No, Carol's loud. I'm going to go over here, too. Um, real quickly, a couple of uh, announcements. I just wanted to uh, piggyback off, off of the, those announcements. Rooted, it, like he said, closes at 3 p.m. because we're getting together, put, putting groups together, placing everything. I'm getting it in place for tomorrow, which is that meeting here, uh, which is the first week of the 10-week journey with Rooted. So if you're looking to get connected in community, I encourage you to sign up uh, before 3 p.m. because that's when we're going to kind of um, get everything together. Alan and Kristen, our uh, community group directors, are going to put all of the groups together along with us and get that moving. So if you're looking to get connected in a group, Rooted is that pathway. Uh, Rooted is the 10 weeks, uh, 10 week commitment uh, with that curriculum. And then uh, the hope and the prayer is that you would then stay connected as a community group and continue to do life together as a group after those 10 weeks are, are happening. So it's a good way to get connected Sunday, Monday through Saturday. Amen. And then, all right, I'm going to have to wake you all up. So I had half a Red Bull, but it was a big one. So come expecting, all right? Uh, now, if we need to get you them, then, then uh, let us know. Uh, the other announcement real quick is VBS, Vacation Bible School. Um, last year we did a Vacation Bible School, and it was a big hit, and it was a success. So we're increasing uh, the amount of people to sign up. Sign-ups are live. Registration is live now. If you have uh, any children or your neighbor's children or your uh, uh, cousins, uncles, friends, daughters, children, whatever it may be, to get them in the house of God, ages kindergarten through sixth grade. I encourage you to sign up on the website or the Church Center app. Uh, this is going to be the last week of June, uh, the 24th through the 29th from 3 to 6 p.m. every day. We have an amazing time. We will transform this place into an underwater playground. I don't know what we're going to have. This is the word I was looking for. But the, the theme is diving into friendship with God. And so it's a scuba theme, uh, really focusing on the fact that we can have a friendship with God. So anyway, if you have kids, if you know of kids, send them our way. Uh, we know that we've seen uh, children come that, don't, that aren't part of this church who have come and gotten grounded in a relationship with Christ just by going to VBS. And then their, 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 their family members also being affected by that as well. And so it's always good. We've got to get the children, and then they influence the family, uh, and then that's how we build the kingdom. That's one of the many ways. Amen? Amen. All right, so VBS registration is live. All right, so let's get right into this. Um, here we are in this series, Who Is This Jesus? Uh, back by popular demand. Um, but uh, this is our second time going, walking through this series, seeking the Lord for new revelation, new ideas as we walk through it. Uh, this is week two. Uh, last week we started with Jesus the Christ in this series, Who is this Jesus? And that is one of the many names or titles that, that we can give Jesus we could talk about. Um, but we only have a couple of weeks in this series. We could talk about how Jesus is the same yesterday, today. Uh, and forevermore, and that Jesus is a builder, and he was building from the very beginning, just like John chapter 1 says, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He, nothing was created without him, so he's been building since the beginning. He was a builder while here on earth, and he continues to build his church now. We know that Jesus was a teacher, right? He is a teacher, and he will be your teacher tomorrow. We know that Jesus is a healer. He's, he's a, a, it, it's very good news. Excuse me, I'm getting all tongue-tied. It's very good news. Uh, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he's still a healer, still a teacher, still a builder, and so on and so forth. So there are actually over 200 names or titles uh, that we can give uh, to Jesus and that are mentioned in the Bible. If we talked about them only on Sunday, it would take us a couple of years to go through all of them, right? And so we're going to keep it condensed into four weeks. But we have provided a document online. So if you go on our website, which is theotherchurch.org, It'll direct you to uh, our website, and then about halfway down, you will see this very graphic, Jesus, uh, who is this? That's the wrong, oh, no, there we go. Who is this Jesus? Uh, and there's going to be a link to a document that has not 200, but 40 of the names and titles of Jesus uh, listed on that website. Uh, here's a couple of them. Jesus is God. Hopefully you know that by now. Uh, number two, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the anointed one. He is the teacher. And you will see that document with um, scriptural references all on there um, available to you. So your homework is to memorize all 40 of those and come ready to present those next week at church, right? You're a little nervous laughter in there. That's okay. No. 
But no, I encourage you to, to, our heart is always that you would be hungry as you leave these doors to know more about the Lord, and that's a great way to do it. So again, check the website, click on the link, you'll have 40 of them um, to kind of help you dig into who is this Jesus. Amen? Amen? All right, so I have this stool, you know I never have a stool, so I might have to lean and sit on the stool a little bit today, um, because my son was in a basketball tournament in Vegas Friday, Saturday, and he played ga- a lot of games. I didn't play any games, but I'm the one that got hurt. So um, when you're rooting for your kids on the sidelines, it's dangerous. It rolled the ankle pretty good. Uh, so far, I'm okay, but thank you guys for putting the stool here. So I might sit down. We'll see. It's a little sore. So I don't, I don't recover as quickly in my <clears throat> old age. But anyway, so uh, I'm just kidding. I know. Um, so anyway, so we're back to this uh, reviewing uh, uh, last week was Jesus the Christ and we talked about how he is the prophet, the priest, and the king of our life, right? He is Jesus Christ, or Christo, Christos. He is the Messiah, right? He is the anointed one. He is the prophet, priest, and king of our lives, right? And he is anointed in all three of those areas because he fulfilled all prophecies to carry out what was needed to be the anointed one in all three of those very areas, right? And if you remember, we talked about how Jesus is my prophet. I can hear him. He's my priest, I can talk to him, and he's my king, I can walk with him, right? He's available, and he can relate to us, because why? The word became flesh, so he understands what we go through on a whole other level, amen? And and this is what we're going to dig deeper, this very truth, in fact, is what we're going to dig deeper into today, as we dive into week two of this series again, who is this Jesus? And so today's answer to that very question, who is this Jesus, It's a little bit different than the others in this series. We're going to talk about the only thing that Jesus was when he was on this earth that he is not now. And what is that? He was human. Jesus, the human, is the title for today's message. And we know that Jesus is not human now, but he was human for 33 years on this earth. And it's very important that we understand that he was human. And what it means to say, you often hear in the, church, in the church, or if you're studying scripture, he's fully God, fully man, right? So it's important to understand what that means, that he was fully man, that he was actually a human, right? And, it, and there, it's a spiritual doctrine actually called identification, that he became human. And, and as the world has a habit of doing, the world has borrowed from this very spiritual, uh, um, the spiritual doctrine called identification, and used it in uh, other areas, and borrowed it. And uh, a great example would be in the political arena, in the political world, in politics. It's an election year. We love talking about politics, right? Let's talk politics. Somebody's like, oh, great. Here we go. You know, I got to tell you, I drank a Red Bull, so I'm going to be excited. You don't have to be. But I am, so that's okay. You know, I know I'm drinking tea now, but it's not chamomile. I'm going to continue with high energy. You can join me or not. So I'm going to have fun by myself. Love you. Thank you. All right. Here we go. So the world borrows all the time from biblical principles. And so how does the world borrow with political in uh, in the political arena and in politics? Well, it would be kind kind of like this. A politician puts on a sharp suit. Goes to Wall Street, starts talking to the stockbrokers, the traders, the people in finance, and says, you know what? My father was in finance, and so I feel your pain. I understand. I identify with you. And then that politician will leave Wall Street, go to the blacked-out suburban, hop in the back seat of that suburban, take the suit off, put on a factory coat and a hard hat, be driven down to the next local factory where the meeting is already set up with the factory workers and managers and say, you know what? Uh, you know what? My uh, father's uncle's brother was a factory worker. And so I feel your pain. I understand you. I identify with you, right? There's that meeting gone to the back of that blacked out suburban, take off the factory coat, the hard hat, and uh, maybe uh, put on some overalls and drive to the farmland and head and have a meeting with the farmers and say, you know what? I feel your pain, farmers. I understand what you're going through because my mother's brother's uncle's sister's friend was a farmer. So I feel your pain. 
right? And the politician will take, they will go back into the back seat of that blacked out suburban, take the overalls off, change into something a little bit more ca- casual, head all the way to the southern border, into a southern border town, and meet with people and say, I, my grandparents lived near the border, and they lived next to some people whose parents were immigrants. And so I understand your pain, and I understand what you're going through, right? This is identification, and it's a real political strategy that we see, and we're going to see a lot more of as we lead up to November, right? And that's borrowed from spiritual identification. But what I love about Jesus is he was not a politician in any way, shape, or form, right? He did not settle for the illusion of identification. He actually became a human being. He didn't just identify with being a human. I created you so I identify with you. No. He became human. He was a toddler. He was in a family. He had brothers and sisters. He worked a job when he was old enough, right? So let's go ahead and dive into and really talk about what it, what it means when we say Jesus was a human. And we're going to be in uh, Hebrews 2 to start. If you're going to turn your Bibles, but let's pray uh, before we jump into God's Word. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for The Word, the Word which is living and active, never returns void. Lord, I pray that as we seek you today with the desire and a hunger to know more about you, Jesus, as the human, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would prepare our hearts for a word in season from you, Lord. I pray that none of me and all of you comes forth, Lord, and we all get a revelation and understanding and a desire to know you more from what we hear from you today. God, we love you and give you all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, so Hebrews 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and uh, we're going to read verse 14 through 16 here, and then we're going to continue on in that same chapter. So verse 14 says this, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Verse 15, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Verse 16, we also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. So it says that he became flesh and blood. So he was human on this earth, right? Jesus knows what it's mean to be born. He knows what it's mean to be a toddler. He knows what it means to be an awkward teenager, right? But, but what does that mean to me today? What does, that, what does that mean to me? Let's continue on in Hebrews 2. Verse 17 says this. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to, ne- to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And now I just want you to notice something because he has suffered and was human and was tempted. He's able to aid those who are tempted, right? So quick question, how many of you have ever been tempted? You've been tempted? Yeah, that should be all hands, right? If you haven't been tempted, I want to know what you, how you get there. But we've all been tempted, right? So check this out. Jesus was tempted as well. Also, we just read, it says that he's able to aid those who have been tempted. We've all been tempted. He's been tempted. Now he can aid us in that temptation. Isn't that a good thing to have somebody that's already been tempted who can relate to us and sympathize us and help us through that? Someone who's already been there before? That's good news, right? Amen, family? All right, there we go. Come on, somebody. Hebrews. We'll stay in Hebrews. Because Hebrews, she doesn't. Anyway, so, uh, old... There goes the dad jokes. All right. Hey, that's what we're going to resort to. All right. Chapter 15, Hebrews 4. Actually, Hebrews better, by the way. So, um, <laughs> but Keurig is pretty easy. Actually, she broke our Keurig. I'm just kidding. Our Keurig broke. My wife didn't break it. <laughs> all right, Lord. Holy Spirit, come back. Thank you, Lord. Hey, while we're having this break for fun, I want to say hi to all of our online audience. And Jesus can relate to you in all ways of your life because he was a human, except he can't relate to watching church online. So you should get here next week and be in this building. I'm just kidding. Hey, everyone. Right? Let's amen. (laughs) 
But hey, uh, say hello to all of our online audience. Uh, go ahead and put in the chat where you're watching from. Um, by the way, family, we have people that watch from Maryland. We have people that watch from Montana. We have people that watch from Canada, uh, California. Where else? We got Kansas, Texas. Anyway, so people do watch from all over, and uh, we are blessed and grateful. So hi, fam. Good to see you. Jesus is the human. Dig in. Hebrews 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Notice how this is written real quickly. We do not have one that can't. What does that mean? It means that we do have one that can. Right? We do have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. Right? But <clears throat> was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. There's a reminder here, the throne is called the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment. Amen? Amen. So when we find ourselves in a time of need, the good news is that we can find help in the time of need. Time of need because it's a throne of grace. And you can find that help because you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You're not coming to a throne of rules and regulations but to a throne of grace. And you can come boldly to that throne. Why? Because Jesus is a merciful and sympathetic high priest. And that's good news. Amen? Amen. Sympathetic meaning that he understands what we're going through because he was a human. And this is important for us to grasp. And I think that we oftentimes glaze over this, right? Jesus was a human. We glaze over the fact that he can sympathize with us. And if you were here last week, we learned that because of that, he can now interpret Our feelings, what we are feeling, whatever we're going through, he can now interpret that to the Father. And and it's like this. Let's say that, oh, sorry. Yeah, he can now interpret that to the Father. I was going to say something else. It's, it's uh, It's not a throne of rules and regulations. He's not a God that's sitting there ready to judge your every move. And, and I remember as a kid praying to God and thinking, I think he might hear me if he has time for me today. Uh, maybe if I pray this enough or say this enough, he might, he's this distant God, might take off some time in his day to listen to me. I kind of had that feeling of who God is, but that's not, that's not who God is, right? He sits on a throne of grace, amen? And so it's like this when we say he can sympathize. It's like, let's say that you're going to a party at somebody's house or an event or the park or whatever it may be, a gathering, and you meet uh, some new people. And in conversation with these new people, you find out that this person you're talking to broke their right wrist. And you're like, oh, I broke my right wrist. How old are you? I was eight. You were eight. I broke it. Which bone? This bone, right? You broke. Oh, man, I did it when I was trying to do a wheelie on my bike. I fell backwards. Oh, that's the same way I did it too, right? And so you have this you're like, I can sympathize, I can identify with you. We have that same, same thing, exact thing happen to us. Or it might be a darker situation. Maybe uh, you, you went through a battle with cancer, right? And you're like, I had this type of cancer and I overcome it. And the person's like, no way, I did too. Oh, where was it? It was here and I had this. And it's like you relate to it. It could be a sickness, an illness, an injury, whatever it may be. Either way, what happens is, There's like this immediate bond, this sympathy, right? And and over the past few years, it's probably been a topic of conversation that we all don't really love to have, and that's the COVID conversation, right? We all know someone, or a lot of us ourselves got COVID at some point, right? Body aches, right? Whether it was body aches, whether it was breathing, whether we went to hospital, didn't go to the hospital, unfortunately, maybe a loved one passed from it, whatever it may be. It's a conversation over the past four years that we've had. But once we have that conversation... Again, there's that immediate bond. It's like that happened to me. It happened to my family member, whatever. There's the, the sympathy so we can sympathize with that person. Why? Because we've been through it already. Are you following me? Yeah. Amen. So check this out. You probably haven't thought through it uh, like this before. But you can say to Jesus, Jesus, I was tempted in this area today. And he will say, oh, yeah, I saw that. Guess what? I was also tempted in this area. And you can say, wait, wait, no, for real? And he's like, yeah. And also, I see that you're, that you're being tempted in this area, and I can sympathize with you because of that. That's how we can talk to our God. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Amen, amen. 
Listen carefully, we have to get this. The reason it's so important and so amazing that Jesus was a human is because he's now sitting on a throne of grace. And the reason it's a throne of grace is because the one sitting on it has been a human being. He's been a human, he understands, and he can sympathize with what you're going through. There is mercy, grace, and help in our time of need and in our time of temptation. This is a throne of mercy, grace, and help, not judgment and criticism. Because the one sitting on it knows how hard it is to live in a fallen, sinful world where the devil is your enemy. He knows. Satan, the enemy of your soul. Remember his objective. What's his objective? To steal, to kill, and destroy, right? And we know that he's the father of all lies. And he has you convinced that you're worse than everyone else. He's like, he will whisper in your ear and he'll say, nobody else said that. Nobody else does this. And by the way, another point, nobody did that horrible thing that you did this week. I I can guarantee you that. As a matter of fact, you're so bad. You've been so bad this week. You shouldn't even be here in church sitting next to all these righteous people because you are not worthy of it. That's what the enemy will tell you. And remember, he's the father of all lies. And that's how Satan does it. But Jesus, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I understand that. And I can sympathize with where you're at because I was tempted. Because the enemy came at me and he told me the same thing. The enemy offered me the world and tempted me in a time of need. He can sympathize with us. So, so we've laid that foundation. Jesus was human. So now, let's get, now we're going to talk about three areas in our lives to see how Jesus understands and can relate to us in those very areas. So um, these are just three um, that I wanted to talk through because I know that we could relate. There are many numerous um, areas where he can relate to us, but I figured we would all relate to this. So let's start with number one. The first one is Jesus understands relationships. Mark 6 verse 3 says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Now, quick side note. I want to put this on the shelf, and we'll talk about it in a minute. It doesn't say son of Joseph. We know that Mary and Joseph is an earthly mom who was born of virgin birth. And then Joseph was his father who became Mary's husband, right? Um, It doesn't say son of Joseph. It says son of Mary. So let's keep that in our memory. Put that on a shelf. We're going to talk about that in a minute. See, Jesus was a part of a family. We know that, right? He had brothers and sisters. And since it was Jesus, they probably never fought in that household, right? No, I don't know about that. All siblings fight, right? And I would say, and I would venture to say, and I would submit to you that Jesus knows what it's like to fight with siblings and to witness siblings fighting. Quick story about siblings fighting in my household. And she keeps proving it over and over again, my daughter. Um, There's a time, many of you have probably heard this story, but uh, Layla, our daughter, who's about to turn eight in May, she was having a bubble bath in the master bathroom. And enjoying her bubble bath all to herself. She was probably around two. Uh, And then my wife was like, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to put Joshua, who was three at the time, just they're only a year and a half apart, in the tub. Give them a bath at the same time. And so Layla's having the time of her life by herself, enjoying this bubble bath. My wife puts Joshua in the tub with them to get them clean. And when my wife's not looking, Layla takes the scoop, the measuring cup, whatever it may be picks up the water. Now Joshua hated water on his head at this time. And Layla knew this at two years old. Proceeded to take that cup and dump it on Joshua's head. And he starts screaming and crying. And she's like, Mama, Joshua wants to get out. (laughs) Mama, Joshua wants out. And then she had to take Joshua out. And then Layla has the bubble bath all to herself again. And you know what? She still does things to this day. This morning, to get under her brother's skin, and she acts like it was nothing. But she's been doing that since the beginning. And so, so what's the point? As you and many of us know, siblings fight, right? And, and I like to imagine, I really like to try to picture and get a visual of what Jesus' life was like then. And imagine in his household with the brothers and sisters. I would imagine that his brothers often heard, why can't you be more like Jesus, right? He's a perfect little brother, and they're like, come on, man. The perfect brother. Why can't you live up to that? Imagine being, growing up, (laughs) 
a, a brother of Jesus, right? So, so Jesus knows about family relationships. He knows what it means to be born. He knows what it means to be a toddler. He knows what it means to be a teenager and go through puberty and awkward stages, right? He knows what it's like to be in junior high. Lord, pray for the junior hires, amen? He knows what it's like to be in high school. He knows what it's like to grow up in a family and do chores. Please tell my children the same thing. Jesus knew what it was like to do chores. He understands what it's like to sneak out of the house. He goes quiet in here. Remember, on the road back home, Jesus booked it, went the other direction, while the caravan went this way, and he was where? He's 12 years old. Two days later, they find him in the temple listening and teaching. So he ditched. He ran away from home, right? He knows what it's like. And they approach him. He's like, did you not know I'd be about my father's business, right? So he understands what it's like. He understands what single life is like. Yes, Jesus lived that single life, family. And someone might say, well, I know an area. Jesus doesn't know what it's like to be married. Maybe true in an earthly manner, but he understands married life. He's a groom. And the church is a bride. How many times do we read in Scripture where it talks about the church, us, the body of Christ, we are the bride of Christ, amen? He also understands what it's like for his bride to be unfaithful. Jesus understands what that's like. And you might say, well, I know he doesn't know what it's like to have children. We are the family of God. We are children of God, amen? Amen. And guess what? He also knows what it's like to have disobedient children. He knows what it's like. He can sympathize. He knows what it's like to have problems with your family, right? He had a little bit of family trouble. Most of his family didn't even believe him until after the resurrection. So many of us here, we probably can, we can now sympathize with him. We have family issues. We know that struggle with family relationships. And in Mark uh, chapter 3, Interesting interaction, verse 31 through 35 says this. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister, and my mother. So Jesus is teaching a multitude, and his mother and brothers sent for him, right? And the people tell him, hey, Jesus, by the way, your mom and your brothers are outside looking for you. And he's like, oh, them? They're not my brothers. That's not my mother. That's not my family. You all here are family. Those who are doing the will of God are the family. And maybe some of us can relate. Family issues, issues with parents, Parents calling for you and you don't want anything to do with them, right? Maybe your parents always show up unannounced to a function that you're at and you know there's no way that they're not going to embarrass you by the end of that function and tell a story about you pouring water on your brother's head in the bubble bath or whatever it may be to embarrass you. Or maybe you have a brother who ruins holidays like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. Or, Or perhaps you have a cousin like Randy Quaid's character in National Lampoons who's ruining holidays, right? Whatever it may be, we can, we can relate, right? We know that family issues happen, and Jesus can relate and sympathize too. And that's why I always call all the people that God has brought together here at Elevate Church family. Y'all are perfect. We don't have any issues relate with relationships in the church. We're family, right? No, it's the reality. But guess what? Jesus can sympathize. So the question may be, why didn't Jesus go greet his family? Why didn't he go out and greet him? So if you quickly jumped up to verse 21, it says this. It's interesting what transpired before those actions. Uh, Verse 21 says, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He's out of his mind. So his family is saying he's out of his mind. So he caught word of that. He's like, they're not my family, right? (laughs) They were like, Jesus is crazy. Maybe they were wishing he just stuck with carpentry or something. They're like, I don't know what he's talking all this son of God stuff because he was a great carpenter. I don't know what they were saying. Uh, and I know this is a yes for me, but your fa- has your family ever thought that you were crazy? Yes. yes. My family has thought that I was crazy. Yes, absolutely. Right? 
maybe you can relate, that's for sure. And you know what is really cool about that? Is you can tell him, Lord, Jesus, they think I'm crazy. And he'd be like, I, I know, I feel you. I understand. I sympathize with that. There's an awesome, fun, and intimate relationship that is available to us to have with the Son of God. All because he was a human. Amen? He knows what it's like to have friends. Right? Think about the story of Martha, Mary, and and Lazarus. We've talked about this on Easter. And and how Martha and Mary were super upset when Lazarus died. Because Jesus didn't come quick enough. And I like to think, kind of looking at that, we can only imagine how they approached him. But they said, Lord, if you had only been here. And sometimes you think, oh, maybe they were sad if you had only been here. Maybe they were angry. I like to think they had attitude. and Like, like Lord, come on, man. I know you could have healed him if you had only been here when I called on you, when I prayed to you, right? If you had only been here. So he understands to have friends like that, to have demands upon him. He knows what it's like to have friends. Jesus also understands what it's like to have your friends bail on you when you need them the most. He understands what it's like to be betrayed by a very close friend. He knows what it's like to have people not like him. I mean, it's hard to believe that a guy who was perfect could have people that didn't like him, right? I mean, maybe some of you perfect people could relate to this. I mean, me, I mean, I'm almost perfect, and believe it or not, there are people that don't like me. Can you believe that? There are. Yeah, I know. It's wild. (laughs) So when you're, when you're going to talk, so my question to you, family of God, is when are you going to talk to him about your family problems? Good. Very, very good. When are you going to talk to him about your relationship problems? When are you going to talk to him about being by, betrayed by friends? Yeah. I feel like sometimes in certain areas we like to compartmentalize and keep things away from him as if he's a distant God who doesn't hear us and won't understand But guess what? It's quite the opposite. He can sympathize, so we have to talk to him about it. There is nothing that is happening in your life that you can't talk to him about. Amen? He's a merciful and sympathetic anointed priest, and there is no area of your life that he has not already experienced. So I encourage you, family, talk to him. Jesus understands relationships. Number two, Jesus understands work. That's right. We chose work. Why? Because a lot of us think that God doesn't understand my business, my job issues, my work issues. He doesn't understand that. Well, guess what? He was a carpenter. Now, my first job, I wouldn't call it work, uh, but I was employed at a movie theater at 15 and a half as soon as I could because I wanted a car. But anyway, so I started working in a movie theater, and that was more like avoiding work and getting free popcorn, free hot dogs, eating as many Snickers bars as I could and watching free movies. I mean, that was it. But then once, many jobs after, I understood what real work meant and what work really meant. And then guess guess what? Jesus could understand. He was a carpenter. He was in the marketplace longer than he was in ministry, right? He probably started around 12 years old, which was common back then. So if you think about it, he lived on this earth 33 years. So that's 30 years that he was, I'm sorry, 12 to 30 is 18, 18 years that he was in the marketplace and only three years in ministry. So he worked as a carpenter. And again, I'm, I'm visual. You ever think about what it looked like, Jesus working as a carpenter? And all the visuals we get because of paintings and pictures and, and whatnot, you know, we dispute on skin color, long beard, short beard, what color hair, whatever. But it's always in a holy robe and sandals, right? That's how we always picture Jesus. But I'm like, no, oh, he was a carpenter. He probably had a tool belt, maybe around the robe. I don't know. He had a tool belt. He had tools, right? He worked. He didn't have like power tools or anything at that time, but he had tools. So he he built things, right? And I bet, I would bet that Jesus was pretty ripped. I mean, I'm just thinking, I mean, he had a physical job. He was probably in good shape. I'm sorry. I just think visually, I'm thinking, hey, he probably had calluses on his hands, right? And, and, And again, he didn't have power tools. But speaking of power tools, have you ever tried to assemble furniture without a power drill? You ever tried that? Like you get your furniture in the meal, mail, whether, it's, uh, whether it came uh, whenever it came because it came all the way from overseas and who knows when it will arrive, uh, or it came from Ikea. But it's you open up the box and you lay everything out and you're like, okay, i got to put this thing together. I don't have my power tools. But they gave me this, this Allen wrench <laughs> and the instructions, who, which are upside down and backwards, are telling me to assemble this, this furniture with an Allen wrench, right? 
And you're like, how am I going to put this together? Have you ever tried to do that? It's so much easier with power tools. And you're looking at this thing like, i got to put this together with this? Like, are you kidding me? And guess what? Jesus put the whole thing together. He built the whole entire thing without power tools, probably more than an Allen wrench, right? And he probably had, and guess what? Jesus, when he put things together, it wasn't labeled A, B, C, D, and color-coded, right? No, he put it together, right? And again, he probably had blisters and cuts and calluses on his hands. He knew what it was like to own a business, right? He knew what it was like to do business with worldly people who lie and cheat in business. Imagine what bargaining was like back then uh, in the Middle East. Middle Easterns bargain a little bit differently. Uh, Even to this day, and I have an experience with that. Uh, My wife's father, you know my wife is Persian. And uh, my father-in-law's business was uh, he would uh, do cleaning, restoration, and repair of fine rugs, Persian rugs. And so I worked with him for a couple of years doing that. And he is the best in the business. And so when they were in Southern California, all of the galleries, the rug galleries on the west side would go to him if there was an issue that would needed repair, uh, if uh, uh, you wanted to whitewash a rug, if it was faded and you need to bring it back to color, he would find the exact colors and dyes that would match and bring the rug back to life. Like he was really good at what he did. He still is, but he's, he's semi-retired and moved to Texas. But anyway, and so I helped him for a couple of years. And I remember dealing with these people and I would watch and I would, this very guy who he would shake hands with and say, okay, this is going to be, this, this project will cost $1,000. Agree, agree, shake hand. He was old school. It was a handshake. And then we finished the job. The person comes to pick it up. And they're like, Aga, what do you mean 1000 You said 500 No, I said, th-. and it's this back and forth and back and forth. They're trying to wheel and deal because they're trying to get every little dime. And I would deliver rugs too. And I would get, throw a bunch of the rugs in the van, drive around the west side of L.A., show up at the, at the gallery, roll the thing out on the floor, knowing very well because I helped him work on this very project that we worked on this side and restored it and it looks beautiful. No one could do a better job. And the rug gallery owner's over here going, what is this right here? I see this line. This is faded. This does not match. Knowing very well we worked over here. Like, why are you lying to me? You're lying through your teeth. We didn't even touch that side of the rug. That's how people bargain, right? And, And Jesus dealt with the same thing. He was in business, right? He also knows what it's like to work in the ministry and work with church people who gossip and lie and cheat and stab you in the back. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> but that, no, but seriously, that was a revelation for me too. It's like, wow, he, Jesus knows what that's like too. He knows what that's like. If he did it to them, he'll do it, they'll do it to me. If they did it to him, they'll do it to you. But he can relate. He knows what it's like to pay taxes, and probably too many taxes. By the way, this is your reminder. Tomorrow is April 15th. It's tax day, fam. All right, so that's from the Lord. Pay your taxes. Amen? Amen. Uh, Well, one person's excited to pay taxes. (laughs) He's probably getting a return. Uh, Anyway. (laughs) So So there's nothing about work. That you can't talk to him about. Jesus understands work. Last point, number three. And you can see all three of them on the screen. Jesus understands relationships. He understands work. Jesus understands pain. He understands pain. We all go through pain, right? And we're going to talk about emotional and physical pain that I'm sure all of us have experienced at some point or another. Uh, And there's a beautiful prophecy in Isaiah 53. Many of you know it. Chapter uh, 53, verses 3 to 5, says this. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. What does all that mean? Well, Jesus understood emotional and physical pain. And that was just a prophecy saying what he will experience, and he very well did. He was despised, rejected, and mocked because of his job, because of his career. Mocked because of his birth, he was called illegitimate. Mocked because of his race. 
King of the Jews was not some glorious title. That was a derogatory sign that was hung above him in the crucifixion. He understands what it means to be mocked and ridiculed. He was mocked while he was hanging on the cross. He was mocked until he took his very last breath on that cross. He understands pain, physical pain. Some of us may or may not know this, but he was beaten by three different groups of guards. He was beaten by Jewish guards, Herod's guards, and Pilate's guards. So it wasn't just one time. They beat him with their fists. They plucked the beard from his face. They beat him with rods. They put a crown of thorns, dug it into his head. They scourged him 39 times. Those are the stripes that that, uh, that chapter talks about. They nailed spikes in his hands and his feet as they hung him on the cross. And this is difficult to talk about, to imagine, or think about in detail. But Jesus was tortured to death. Our king, our prophet, our priest was tortured until he died. So he understands pain. So the question for you is, if he understands it, when are you going to talk to him about your pain? Now I want to tell you something, and you got to get this, family of God. You're not as bad as you think you are. Just because you're struggling or you're hurting or you're failing at something, he loves you anyway and he understands. Do you know why? Why? Because he was a human being. The one sitting on the throne knows what it's like to be a human being and live in a fallen world and to have uh, demons and, and the enemy trying to attack you consistently and constantly. He doesn't love you because you're perfect. He loves you because he knows what an incredible struggle it is to live in a fallen world, and have the devil on your back constantly. So you're doing better than you think you are. You have a high priest who understands and sympathizes with you. His throne is a throne of grace that you can come to in your time of need. Why did he give up heaven? Why did he give up heaven? Think about this. Why did he give up heaven? Be born, be a toddler, be a teenager, go through all the stages, have relationship problems, get cold and hungry. Why? So he could be a merciful and faithful priest, not a judgmental and critical priest. Most of us are more judgmental and crit- critical than Jesus ever is. So my question again, when are you going to come to him with your relationship problems, your work problems, your hurts, your struggles, your fears? When are you going to come to him as your friend? When are you going to come to his throne of grace and mer- mercy to receive the help that is available to you? Again, I feel like we compartmentalize and we put certain things aside thinking that he can't relate. But I'm telling you right now, Jesus was a human. He can relate to everything that you're going through. One more thing about emotional pain and about Jesus being a human. And we talked that about putting that shelf thing on the shelf. Let's pull it back off the shelf. And we read in Mark where it says, is this not the son of Mary? Matthew says the same thing. Is this not the son of Mary? In another instance, when Jesus was teaching, they asked, who is teaching? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, excuse me. And John records it this way. And this is what the crowd said, according to John. Is this not the son of Joseph? So why is John saying, is this not the son of Joseph? But Mark and Matthew are saying, is this not the son of Mary? This is very important because you may or may not know this, but John records the first two years of Jesus' ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the third year and final year of Jesus' ministry. John wrote the Gospel of John years later. This was after all of the disciples besides him were were martyred, right? And he writes it years later because he read Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version, and they were good, but they had only recorded the last year of Jesus' ministry. So that's why in the book of John you have things that you will not find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Gospels. This means similar. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, excuse me, are synoptic gospels. In John, you'll find things that you will not find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For example, John 2, you have the turning water into wine. John 3, the conversation with Nicodemus. John 4, you have the woman at the well. John 5, the man at the pool of Bethesda. John 9, the blind man. We also have in John 11, Lazarus. This is all the first two years of his ministry. And all these things have more detail because John records the first two years. Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only the third year. So watch this. Matthew and Mark say what? Isn't this the son of Mary? 
They're recording the third year of his ministry. So they say, is this not the son of Mary? All of them start with the birth, and all of them, meaning the Gospels, finish with and end with the crucifixion. But as far as his ministry goes, John recorded the first two. Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded the last year. So this is important. Let's get this. John's recording the first two years, and he writes, isn't this the son of Joseph? When Jesus is on the cross, John wrote something a little bit differently that is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he describes it like this. Jesus is on the cross, and he's looking down at Mary, his mother, and John, the disciple. And he says to Mary, he says, behold your son. And he says to John, behold your mother. Now in that time, the oldest, firstborn, would take care of the mother if, if it was needed. And Jesus was the firstborn son. And the Bible says, from that day on, Mary went home to live with John. She wouldn't have gone home to live with John if Joseph had still been alive. So John, Jesus imparted on John, you are now to take care of Mary. What does that mean? Well, historical, historical documents of that time record that Joseph died in Jesus' final year of his ministry. When I say he understands everything, have you ever lost a loved one? Jesus understands. And think about it like this, too. This is amazing because this was during his ministry. Jesus was already in the business of raising people from the dead. And his father, his earthly father, Joseph, passed away. He could have raised his father from the dead, but he didn't. So maybe, it doesn't tell us, but maybe, just maybe, Jesus didn't raise his father from the dead because he wanted to experience the death of a loved one so he could be a sympathetic high priest for his children, for his sons and daughters. That's how good of a God we serve, an intentional God. For 33 years, he was a human being so he could be a merciful and faithful priest that we could go to in our time of need and receive grace and help. Now in a minute, we're going to pray. But before we do, I want us to reflect for a moment. I'm sure that many of us have maybe gotten visions or ideas or the Lord put things in our heart or mind as you're listening to this. And this may, this may all be new information for you. Uh, it might be a reminder to you, uh, or you may have studied it yesterday. Either way, I want you to allow God to speak to you right now. Let the Holy Spirit minister. Remember, we can hear him, we can talk to him, and we can walk with him because he is the anointed one in all three areas. And for me, while going through this and digging into this, I was more grateful to the Lord than I ever have been. I really, really I took a step back. And looked at how Jesus really did make it a point to walk through everything. Think about this, 30 years of walking this earth before he even started to do ministry. So that he could relate and sympathize with you and me. What a good God we have. Let's go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. And just let the Holy Spirit minister. This is a time when our Lord is reminding us, his sons and daughters, that he was human and he can sympathize with everything we go through, with all that we go through. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And that same attitude of prayer and reflection. Many of us here have had a point in our life where maybe we can remember as clear as day when we surrendered all, repented, turned away from our life and said, I want you, Lord. In order to have a throne of grace to approach boldly, we have to have a relationship with him. We have to believe in him fully with all of our heart, 
And the Bible says that when we do confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord, that we become children of God. And that is the time when we can have that high priest to approach who has been through it all and can sympathize with us. What a good God we have. And so if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to invite him into your life. So if that's you, you've never said a quick prayer, you've never turned away from your life, you never turned fully toward the Lord Jesus. We're going to say a prayer in a moment as a reminder to us, but I encourage you to step into this moment, accept this invitation. So if that's you, you're saying, I want a relationship with Jesus, really quickly, if you could just slip your hand up in the air and say, yeah, that's me. I want a relationship with Jesus. That's right. I feel my heart beating now. I'm just going to raise my hand. That's me. See those hands. Amen. Amen. It's beautiful. Go ahead and put your hands down. If you've come to the Lord at some point, been in church, grown up in church, repented, ran towards the Lord, but now you're doing things on your own, you're running for the world, and you're like, this is my moment. I'm coming back to you, Lord. If you just want to show God that, you want to boldly profess that, go ahead and you raise your hand up in the air now. Just say, I'm coming back to you, Lord. Been away for a while. I'm coming back to you, Lord. Coming back to you with everything I have. Amen. Beautiful. See those hands. Go ahead and put your hands down. Church, let's say this. Let it be a reminder. Let this be a marker. We're drawing a line in the sand. This is a reminder of how good our king is. So say this with me, church. You repeat after me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you died for me, that you rose from the dead, and that you are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. Thank you for loving me. I give you my life. I turn it all over to you. Lead me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Beautiful, thank you. I believe and I pray that you are encouraged today to know that the God we serve can sympathize with everything you're going through. I encourage you, family. Check the website, look at the list of things, dig into scripture. Be encouraged that he was a human. He knows what you're going through. Don't set things aside that you don't want to approach the king with. I promise you he can relate to it. Amen? Go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to finish with one, that worship song, One Look, which says, Oh, how beautiful, oh, how glorious. Just one look at Jesus and my face is in the ground. And I want you to sing this, proclaim this, praise this. The Bible says that the Lord, that God in, inhabits the praises of his people. So if you want him, in, him inhabiting your praises... Praise his name, not because you feel good today, but because he deserves it, because he is worthy, because he's a God who spent 33 years on this earth so that he could sympathize with every little thing that we go through. What a good God we serve, amen? amen. Let's go ahead and lift a hand to heaven. Also, really quickly, I forgot about our prayer team. I don't want to forget about our prayer team. We have an amazing prayer team. If you lifted your hand, uh, when we said that prayer, please see our prayer team. We have three here, three there. They have been praying for, interceding for you already, and they are prepared to pray for you, to stand in agreement with you. If you're having a hard time understanding that God can sympathize with you, they will pray for you. If you need uh, help and support walking through something, they're available to you. Please take advantage of the fact that God has placed people here right next to you in this place that will pray for you, pray over you, and stand in agreement. Also, if you need a Bible, you don't have a Bible, our prayer team can get that for you um, after service as well. So anytime during the song, you can go ahead and step over to our prayer team, even right now, if you'd like to. Just go ahead and go get prayed for. They will lay hands on you, pray with you, stand in agreement. Let's lift a hand to heaven. Father in heaven, thank you for your plan to reconcile your sons and daughters right back unto you, your creation right back in relationship with you. What a good God you are. And I thank you that part of the, that plan was your son, your son Jesus, who is not only the Christ, the anointed one, the prophet, the priest, and the king of our life. He is and was, he was a human. And I thank you, Jesus, that you came to this earth and walked it out. 
so that you could sympathize with us. Wow, what a glorious king you are. We thank you, Jesus, and we exalt your name. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you lead us to praise him more. I praise, God, I just praise you. I'm so grateful right now, Lord. We are so grateful for your goodness. And Holy Spirit, lead us so that even in our most difficult situations, we can bring it to you and we can exalt and praise your name in all that we've been through. God, we glorify your name in Jesus' name.